All right, so this is Board Games and Intellectual Property Law. Um, and just to introduce everyone real quick before we start going, I'm Paul Bender. I'm the um, manager and CEO of Greater Than Games. And then uh, two of our attorneys are here. So Jennifer Beasley is an attorney at the law firm of Jenkins & Kling in St. Louis. And she's uh, Missouri uh, practicing corporate law in Missouri. And so she'll talk initially about a bunch of uh, she'll talk about a bunch of stuff about contracts and corporate law. But first, um, James Daly is a patent attorney. He's a lecturer at Washington University in St. Louis, and he's the author of a book, of the blog Law in the Multiverse, and the book The Law of Superheroes. So he will but he'll be talking about intellectual property law first. So. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a quick disclaimer, uh, so we are attorneys, but we're not your attorneys. This is not legal <laughs> advice. We can't give legal advice uh, specific to your situation, only general information. So we're certainly happy to have uh, Q&A after we love a, a little bit of uh, sort of uh, pre-written spiel to talk about some uh, issues uh, with intellectual property and board games. Uh, but after that, we'll open up to Q&A. Again, happy to answer that, but we can't, we can't give legal advice. Uh, in, in any event, uh, I'm licensed in Missouri, and Jennifer's licensed in Missouri and Illinois, not Indiana, so we couldn't give you advice here even if you wanted to. Um, so, uh, I'm going to first we'll talk about the major types of intellectual property. Uh, this is something that people will confuse often. Um, if you're familiar with this already, I apologize for being a, maybe a little remedial, but, um, but especially on the internet, uh, people, you see people confusing aspects of, of different kinds of intellectual property pretty frequently, so I'll we'll go over that. Um, the major types of intellectual property are copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and trade dress. And in this industry, copyright and trademark are probably the most important. Uh, you do see uh, patents uh, and trade secrets uh, and trade dress sometimes, but they're not quite as uh, common, whereas copyrights and trademarks, especially copyrights, are pretty going to be pretty essential to pretty much all uh, board games. Uh, and, and when I say board games, and, and when we talk about board games, we mean board games, card games, tabletop games, uh, miniatures, the kind of pretty much everything you'd imagine here at Gen but we use board game as a, as a shorthand. So I don't mean to exclude uh, the card game folks, certainly, yeah. better than yeah. playing card games. Or role playing games or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not electronic games. Yeah, tabletop games. Yeah. Um, so uh, to begin with, we'll talk about copyright. It's probably the single most important. And so what is copyright? Copyright includes the artistic aspects of a game, such as graphical art, flavor text, lore text, figure sculpts, audio and video elements, if, if those apply. Um, it includes the instructional text as separate from the rules of the game itself. Um, so the more uh, flavor text elements, one way to think about this is if you think about um, a, a cooking blog, you might have this, invariably, you have this long bit at the beginning talking about how this is their grandmother's recipe and the story of how they learned to make it as a child and all this stuff and a bunch of pictures. And then at the bottom, they'll finally have the recipe. Um, the, the, the actual just bare bones list of ingredients, straightforward list of steps, recipe is not really copyrightable. Uh, the stuff at the top, all that uh, you know, story and photos and that kind of stuff, that creative expression, that's copyrightable. And the same thing applies with a, with a board game. Um, just the, the bare bones uh, essentials of how to play a game um, is not really copyrightable. This copyright statute explicitly excludes instructions and rules and things like that. Um, but the, the specific way that you have explained the rules, especially if it if it comes along with in-universe in uh, aspects or little stories about how the game was developed or, or whatever, then that could be potentially copyrighted. Um, it also includes game characters, although generic stock characters are not protectable. So if you just have a really thin uh, outline of a character, like this is the mustache twirling villain and that's about it, uh, you know, a John Q. bad guy, uh, that's, that's probably not copyrightable, but if you have a fully fleshed out character, uh, you know, a, 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 a Drist or uh, uh, many of Greater Than's characters, for example, uh, have significant backstories and um, uh, you know, they have a biography, they have a list of fictional comic books they've appeared in, a list of actual comic books they've appeared <laughs> in, um, that kind of thing. Uh, that, that tends to be more, more towards where the, the character itself is protected. Um, so, those are things the copyright does include, what it doesn't include. It doesn't include the game title, short phrases, or slogans. It doesn't include, again, the rules of the game, at least in the most basic, purely instructional form. And it doesn't include any functional aspects of game components. This doesn't come up so much in board games, but if you invented a, a, a new kind of uh, random number generator, like, so not dice or a spinner, but 
some new way to come up with random numbers. It, it, you couldn't copyright the actual way that works. That's more something that would be possibly the subject of a patent. Um, so uh, that's what copyright does and doesn't include. How do you get it? Well, one of the neat things about copyright is that it's automatic. As soon as you have fixed whatever the work is, whether it's the picture or the text or what have you, as, long as, as soon as it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression, piece of paper, file on a computer, photograph, you name it, then bam, copyright it. Uh, that is a very low bar, but it's still a bar. Um, for example, merely discussing an idea doesn't create a copyright. You've got to at least write it down, send an email, something. Um, you can't, if you're chatting with a fellow board game designer here at Gen Con, you hit on this really great idea, there's no protection yet. Uh, you you got you to write it down. Um, uh, you don't have to register a copyright for the copyright to exist, although registration has benefits that have to do with being able to sue in federal courts and the kind of damages you can obtain, but uh, you, you don't have to register a copyright for, for, it, to, for, for it to exist. Um, uh, something you've probably heard a lot about is fair use. Uh, the, this is a sort of nebulous uh, concepts that people bandy band about a lot that, oh no, it's okay that we can use this other thing that somebody else created because we're using it a little differently or, or something like that. Um, in the board game context, most board games are commercial works. Um, it's probably a lot better to use original content or content that's in the public domain rather than relying on fair use. Um, fair use is a defense. Uh, so you can still get sued for copyright infringement, and then the burden is on you to prove that your use was fair use. Um, and when you're already staring down the barrel of uh, six-figure statutory damages for copyright infringement, suddenly having to spend a lot, uh, suddenly having to argue, oh no, no, it's fine. Our use is defensible under the Copyright Act. Um, that's a bit of a gamble because if you lose six figures, how many of you, either you or your companies, could afford to take? a six-figure statutory damages hit, um, and, and the end of that product. Um, so uh, probably you want to stick together to original content or public domain content. But if you do that, be careful that you aren't basing your work on an adaptation that's still under copyright protection. A good example of this is the Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz stories are either all, or at least the, the basic ones, are in the public domain. Um, you can make a Wizard of Oz board game. What you couldn't do is make a board game that included elements from the MGM motion picture, or Wicked, or any other more modern adaptation that includes elements that aren't in the original books. Anything that they added, those authors and creators added after the fact, is still subject to copyright and could land you in big trouble. So Wicked, for example, had to be very careful to be based on the original not, and not have some of those elements that only appeared in the MGM film. Uh, uh, one of the problems with fair use is that it's a, a factor, a four-factor test. It, it's, it's sort of mushy. Um, the court's way, the purpose and character of the work, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, so where, whether, for example, it's commercial or non-commercial, um, the, uh, the nature of the work, the amount and substantiality, the portion, the portion used in relation to copyrighted works as a whole, so like how, much did you, how much did you take from the original, and how much of your work does that make up? and the commercial impact. So how, how much money did you take from the other, other person, basically? Um, and again, a lot of that doesn't look so great for the board game case, because oftentimes the work is commercial. You probably are, quite possibly are, taking either money directly from the other work, or at least foreclosing them selling their own board game adaptation. And so, and, but again, it's hard to predict what a court will do with those factors in any given case. Um, some courts weigh different, weigh different factors a little more heavily than others, um, and it's just, it's really hard for an attorney to, if you ask them, hey, does this look like fair use to you? The attorney's going to say, it depends. Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, it's just whether you want to gamble about that. So, um, last thing I wanted to note was uh, a recent copyright case involving a board game. How many of y'all have heard of the, the game Bang? It's a card game, like a spaghetti western card game? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so it's a, it's a card game based on spaghetti westerns, uh, and uh, there was a company that made a clone of the game where they took all the western elements and replaced it with medieval and ancient China. 
Um, and, but other than that, exactly the same. Exactly the same rules, exactly the same number of characters with the same characteristics, the same special abilities, the whole thing. Total mechanical copy. The only thing that changed was the text. Um, so uh, the owners of Bang sued, uh, alleging uh, copyright infringement. Uh, the suit was filed in 2014 and concluded in 2016. Um, it's only a copyright, or excuse me, it's only a trial court decision, so this isn't a big, like, Supreme Court precedent or something, so take this with a little grain of salt. It doesn't necessarily apply everywhere. Um, but um, the, the, the case went as, as I, as an attorney, would expect, which is that the court ultimately decided the, the, the characters, the character abilities in Bang were either generic stock abilities, they're just sort of like uh, stock characters, like uh, the sheriff or the deputy. There's it's not really much there. Um, uh, or they were just part of the rules of the game. The, ba the basic, like, you can, uh, you know, attack a character so many spaces away for so much damage kind of thing. Um, uh, and neither of which was protectable by copyright. Um, the court can, summed up its decision as, copyright does not protect systems that set the stage for expression to occur. An example they made is to, like, basketball. Early on in the history of basketball, there were efforts to copyright the rules of basketball and say, not just anybody can sell a copy of the rules of basketball or play basketball games. You have to have a license or something. Um, and the court said no, because the rules of basketball are just simple rules. They, they say you can score a point by shooting the ball into the hoop from this part of, part of the court. Uh, they, they don't say there's no story there. There's no plot. There's no narrative. It doesn't say that anybody actually will try to do that. I mean, theoretically, you do whatever you want in a game of basketball. You could pass the ball to the other team and lose on purpose if you want. Um, you know, you can play like the Harlem Globetrotters do. Um, uh, so the, the, the court said that, you know, there's not copyright expression there. Same thing with board games. Uh, the bear rules, not protectable. This, this case kind of reinforces that. But if you have rules that have more of a plot, more of a narrative, more creativity, um, an example that I would give, and this is, I'm not saying this is necessarily the case. Uh, they're not clients of mine, and who knows what a court would actually do. Uh, but uh, if you've played um, uh, Betrayal on the House on the Hill, um, the, there are scenarios that are outlined in the, in the game that say, these characters are trying to accomplish this, this character is trying to accomplish that, there's a you know, betraying character, a traitor <coughs> mechanic uh, going on, and there's a little narrative, a little story about how you've awak awakened this particular ancient evil and this is what you're trying to do. Those rules are there's the creativity there, there's a little short story built into that, and it's laying out a plot. It's saying, you'll try to actually accomplish these specific goals and uh, within the larger rule set. That's a little more, that's a little, probably more protectable. Um, somebody who wanted to copy that would probably have to come up with their own set of little vignettes, their own set of little stories. Um, so that, that's where that line is, I think, somewhere, somewhere around there. So that's uh, the basics of copyright. Uh, we'll take a pause to let that sink in. Uh, any quick questions about copyright specifically? Yeah. So if you're if you're writing your rules so that it includes that creativity aspect, say so. I mean, will parts of that document that are a little bit more well, bare bones not be copyrighted, but like the creativity parts around it be copyrighted, or is it just like? This is a sheet of paper with rules and creativity, so the whole thing. Is uh, so, right. so no, there's a there's a sense of of uh, severability that you could that you could have someone could create a document that was just here's like how, how many of y'all played art and horror? So again, there's like a little bit of like vignettes and mythos and stuff around in there and the instructions. You probably also, if you played art and horror successfully, you've probably found online the sort of abbreviated rules that are easy to follow, a rewritten uh, manual. Um, that's probably OK, where someone has taken the rules and just distilled them down to their mechanical essence um, as a reference. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's probably OK. Um, what, what they couldn't do is, is include all that other creative uh, stuff around. Which isn't to say you wouldn't register it. So he, he touched briefly on you don't have to register it, but you can. If you were registering it, you would register your full thing. It's just that it, <coughs> what is right. actually being protected under the law is the creative expression, not the if they 
sort of black line it down to move this one space. That's not what it's protecting. So, so if Bang had a more creative narrative, but somebody wanted to make like that version that's more medieval and Chinese, not country western, like, so would they still be able to do that as long as they didn't include any of the creativity, but just the bare bone mechanics? Yeah. So if you uh, again, it's hard to say for certain. I don't want to take the anyone to take this uh, definite. Uh, no, not least because it should be pointed out that copyright law is a is a federal statute that governs and some treaties that govern copyright law, but there are regional differences where the various circuit courts have slight differences of opinion. So that's another little uh, uh, bit of treachery. Um, uh, if, for example, it wouldn't work for them to just replace all the Italian names or the Western names with Chinese names, uh, just like you can't make a book called um, uh, John. Uh, plumber and the book of hidden truths, uh, or, or, or the chamber of hidden truths, the, the, the chamber of secrets, Harry Potter. Oh, okay. uh, um, you, you you can't just like change all the names in, in Harry Potter, but otherwise keep it the same. Um, you, you would have to come up with your own, their own new plot lines that were appropriate to the Chinese setting. I mean, or, or inappropriate to the oh, right. <laughs> how, how good they wrote it, but um, but they would have to come up with their new story, their own new stories. Uh, but the underlying basic mechanics could still be. And one thing to note about the Bang litigation is it's getting at exactly where that line is, but you'll note the case took two years because it survived a motion to dismiss. So the court initially found like, hey, this is a close enough call. We need to make a, you know, take a further look at it and, and go through discovery and that yeah, sort of thing. They, they, so, yeah. There was at least the possibility that the rules and characters could have been expressive enough to qualify it. In, the end, in the end, it wasn't uh, for the reasons that we discussed, but, it, but it, the court at least accepted there was a possibility. Does that? Yeah, I mean, I think the more creative, the more creativity you put into it, at least like it, they'll want to copy it anyway. I think it was so easy, perhaps, because there wasn't that much depth there that they were like, yeah, okay, let's just put this in another thing and do it. And there's important reasons why you don't want it to be copyrightable to have these basic rules. Like, think how much of a problem it would be for you as board game designers yeah, sure. if, if someone awesome. could copyright roll two dice and move that many spaces. Or, I mean, Monopoly's a terrible game, but you get the idea. Uh, so I think there's one, one more question, and then we'll move on to trademarks, yeah. You said you don't have to copy, uh, register the copyright for it to exist, so could you give an example of like that and how it works? Like, is it just saying it's copyrighted, it's most secure, that's... Yeah, so there's nothing magic you have to do. Um, uh, this outline that uh, Jennifer and I have prepared for this talk is copyrighted. Sorry, hands off. <laughs> um, but, but there's but it at the bottom it doesn't say copyright 2017 Jennifer Beasley James Daly it doesn't say anything like that it doesn't need to there are no um, sort of uh, requirements like that anymore there used to be but, but there aren't anymore that was done away with to make copyright really streamlined and consistent across uh, countries um, uh, so if you want some if you want to let somebody know if you want to just sort of remind people hey this is not being distributed under an open gaming license like we are we do claim some some pr uh, property of this, then sure, by all means, put you know copyright uh, your co your company uh, on there. Um, but that's just sort of a polite signal so that people know. Hey, like, uh, uh, the the benefit uh, the registration process consists of uh, sending some some money and a copy of the work in question to the copyright office. Uh, it takes a a while uh, unless you pay several hundred dollars for expedited processing. Uh, it takes um, uh, three to six months. Yeah, three to six months. It takes well, quite some time, I think, uh, typically for them to process it. I mean, it's a very straightforward process. They just have a long backlog, um, and uh, and you do have to register to do certain things, like file an infringement suit against another company, at, or an individual and there are some benefits to registering earlier that are very specific to when you get into litigation and what the court is going to um, assume in your favor for the registered copyrights and statutory damages but to like have copyright protection you don't have to register yeah uh, okay. one last question we're going to move on to trademark and if we have more copyright questions at the end that's fine no 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 this is copyright or something else but what if you had like so you have uh, cards and, and you use like Red background and white lettering. Ah, so there's a there's a bare minimum bar of creativity for, for copyright, and it's really really low, but it's there. Um, an example of something that, that isn't is just pure facts. 
So the, the phone book is a famous, famous case. Um, you may have noticed uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, but before the internet and cell phones kind of made this all pointless, there was an explosion of, of different yellow pages for us. Um, it wasn't just the one phone book from the phone company anymore. There's a bunch of people offering copies of the, the yellow pages. It's because they, they, uh, there was a, a case that just decided that the mere listings of stuff in the phone book is not copyrighted. There's not enough there. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a little bar. And so that really minimal stuff, like just the basic layout and things like that, color choices, usually not enough. Um, I mean, uh, we'll talk about trade dress later, yeah, but probably not enough. But for yeah, yeah, but probably not enough. For All right. So trademarks. Uh, just as I mentioned, that the the things like the title or character names and things like that may not necessarily be copyrightable. And you think, well, how can we protect that? The answer is a trademark. Uh, and a trademark is a word, phrase, symbol, design, or some combination of that um, that identifies and distinguishes the source of uh, goods or services of one party from those of others. So brand names, logos, using like goods and services. Um, it's important to note that uh, the point of a trademark is a little bit different than a lot of other intellectual property. The point of a trademark is not so much so that the trademark owner um, has this valuable property right. It's, there's a consumer protection aspect. There's, there's the aspect of, if I go buy Nestle brand water, um, I'm, I can look at that and see, ah, it has the Nestle trademark on it. It's coming from the same place all the other Nestle brand water has come from. Um, and I, if I happen to like this brand of water, then great. And it's not that terrible Aquafina water or whatever. Um, uh, that's very different than, uh, than the purpose of copyright, for example, which is to encourage people to create uh, new, new works. Um, uh, presumably, uh, Nestle would still try to sell people water uh, if they could. Um, uh, so that, that's an important difference. And that's going to shape a little bit about some of those particular rules with, with the trademarks. Um, uh, so uh, that's more to bear in mind. The service marks are the same as trademarks, except they are for services rather than goods. Most board game companies don't offer services. If you offered like an electronic, um, uh, an, inter an internet version of your um, of your uh, game where people could play online, then that may, might be more of a service, uh, uh, an online platform. But generally speaking, you're, you're selling stuff, tangible, tangible stuff. Um, uh, Another big difference about trademarks versus uh, other kinds of intellectual property, or at least compared to copyright, copyright is strictly federal. There's no state copyright. With trademarks, they're both state and federal trademarks. Um, and uh, federal trademarks are the more important of the two by a, a good margin, but the state marks do exist. So those are some of the things that it covers. Um, what it doesn't cover. Uh, trademarks are different than domain names. There's a whole special protection process for domain names called the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Process. Um, and um, we're not going to get into that. But suffice to say that owning a trademark can be an important bit of evidence in a domain dispute, but it's, but it's a separate thing. Trademarks are also different than a registered business name. Um, you Just because you've registered a business name does not automatically give you a trademark in it or vice versa. Um, and uh, Jennifer can talk more about, about the uh, business name issues. So how you get trademarks? Again, very different. Partly because of that consumer protection aspect, you don't get a trademark, a federal trademark automatically. You have to, sub you have to submit an application for it. You have to register it. Um, that's the big difference. That is the difference. If you notice, some, some products say you know, product name TM versus product name that little R in the circle. Um, DM just means we're using this as a trademark. We consider this a trademark, and that may have important uh, be important for various reasons. There's, a, there's such a thing as a common law trademark, for example. Um, the R means that it's a registered trademark. It has actually been registered with the Federal Trademark Office, or at least that's what it's supposed to mean. Sometimes we use it inappropriately. That's what it's supposed to mean. Registering for a trademark costs a few hundred bucks. Uh, it takes a few months, about three to four months, if everything goes smoothly. It could take like a year if, if, it go, if it's complicated, like uh, if your mark is too similar to one that already exists and you have to convince the office that no, it's really okay for some reason. Um, and another big, big difference with uh, a trademark is that with a, with a copyright, you can write, you can create your game and then just sit on it for a year or two and then finally you release it because maybe you were, um, 
uh, waiting for the you know to find funding or to quit your day job or whatever. Um, with uh, and and it's still copyrighted that whole time, all the way back to when you created it. With the trademark, you have to be uh, for a federal trademark. You have to be using the mark. You have to actually be selling products with that mark on it in order to register it. Um, very important thing. How many of y'all either use or are considering using Kickstarter? That's a funny question. Right, so a lot of you. a Kickstarter campaign is not considered use in commerce. You need actual wholesale, wholesale or retail availability. Um, so uh, you can't uh, say, all right, here's you know my board game title. I'm going to submit that to the trademark office to register it. And they say, when did you start using it? Oh, our Kickstarter campaign started you know two months ago. Uh, they're going to say, that's not good enough. Your product's not actually for sale. Because as we all know, Kickstarter is not a store. And those aren't, you know, people aren't buying stuff. They're just pledging their support for the project, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, so, if, but even if a mark isn't in use yet, you can still submit an application. It's just sort of a placeholder. And then you can say, we, we have a good faith intent to use this mark later on. And then later, when you do have to start using it, you can convert it to a, a full-blown application, and then you sort of like save your place in line. It's just a little more expensive for having uh, uh, done, done it that way. Um, so that's uh, that's how you that's the basics of how you get at least a federal trademark. There's uh, other rules for for state marks and, and common law marks, but federal trademarks are the most important. So we won't go into detail there. Yeah. And yeah, no, my, my my question was: um, so you do your Kickstarter, you're successful, you start selling. And you immediately then switch over and start selling on Amazon.com. That would be that would work. Yeah, yeah. So th those sales are those are fine. Yeah, those are real sales. Um, and it doesn't have to be online. You know, if, if, once you have the physical product. Then yeah, it has to be more than just like one or two copies you printed off at home and like gave to a play tester or sold to your brother-in-law or something like that. It has to be like a, a bona fide use in commerce. You have to be, you know, it, there's no magic number there either. But you know. You, they they do have some some sort of threat some sort of threshold. Um, no, you don't have to like send sales numbers to the, the trademark office or anything. It's just that if there was litigation later, they could say, "Well, you weren't really selling it when you said you were." And that's a problem. So, there's a good real rule of thumb: wait till you're you know have normal retail availability. Uh, yeah. So, will you be covering trademark classes and where we fall? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, so when you register for a trademark, you have to specify what class of goods or services that your mark is for. And there are uh, 100 or so major classes and then lots and lots and lots of variations and subtle differences. Uh, most board game products, I think, are in class 22. Um, and uh, the, there's two important things to bear in mind for this. One, um, when you register a mark, it's for that class. If somebody, if you register um, uh, Sensibles of the Multiverse for uh, product placement, uh, for <laughs> board games, and then somebody goes and creates Sensibles of the Multiverse. Um, Shampoo. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, that's probably fine. The trademark office is probably going to say, yeah, that's really, really, really different. Unless you were Disney or, 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 or unless you're Marvel or DC or something like that. Um, people don't normally make uh, superhero themed shampoo like adaptations from comics. So, what if they put our exact logo from the game on their shampoo, though? Like well, with the same colors and stuff. That's different. Uh, um, that's that's like a passing off uh, issue uh, that's a little bit different um, okay. than just trademark, normal trademark infringement. Um, uh, but if they wanted to register Sentinels of the Multiverse for uh, a video game, uh, well, which would you find? Already done, but yeah. right? uh, well, we initially <laughs> Sentinels was was tra was only trademarked for board games, but then it was uh, but then uh, later we, we added video games. But before that, what if somebody did Sentinels for, for video games? The trademark office would likely have said that's too close. They're both games, so what kinds of games? And people make video game adaptations of board games all the time, and indeed they did. Um, uh, so there's this there's a sense of of a sort of zone of protection, the natural areas of expansion, uh, <coughs> both in terms of. Uh, 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 subject matter and also geography. Uh, derivative works fall in. So derivative work is a is a copyright uh, concept, not a trademark concept. Uh, and um, the, the test for with with trademark is a likelihood of confusion. Uh, would a consumer, would, would, would the typical customer, uh, be likely to be confused 
if they are looking at the uh, video games for sale at Best Buy and they see Sentinels of Multiverse, they they might very well think, oh yeah, that's surely that's the same thing. Um, and so that's that's the test. Um, not actual confusion, although actual confusion, if you can find evidence like through doing surveys or something, you can find that yeah, people were legit confused by this. That's pretty good evidence of a likelihood of confusion. People were actually confused. But you don't have to prove that. You just have to prove that it was likely. Um, uh, so that's why there's that sort of nebulous uh, area there. The other important thing about those classes when you register for a trademark is that you can't say that you're registering for a class that you aren't actually using it in. When we registered for uh, board games, we couldn't say video games too because we weren't using it in video games yet. It would have been fraud on the trademark office uh, if we had done that, and it would have been a basis for having the mark uh, canceled uh, later on. So, Which is why we don't have the shampoo. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. We have yet, yet to make shampoo. Yeah, someday. Yeah. Um, so you might think, so you might to be tempted to think, oh, well, we'll just like register for all kinds of crap and get it out of the way, and, then, and we'll be so protected because nobody will be able to get like shampoo or farm equipment or you name it. And no, you really, it does need to be pretty, pretty tractor. Exactly. It does need to be rel fairly narrowly written for what you're actually doing. Yeah, and even the intent to use, there are requirements for. Again, you good faith intent to that use. That was my real question with the intent right. piece. How does that fall in? And how would somebody else know that somebody else already set that in motion? So you answer that question by well, the patent, the, the trademark applications are published. Yeah. Uh, so, so people, can, so when you see, if you want to decide, hey, what do I, what do I want to call my game? What do I want to call my company? Right. Well, a good thing to do is, you do yourself, or hire an attorney to do, or hire a, com a trademark search company to do, is have them look and see what trademarks are out there. Do the hire an attorney thing. Don't it, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, this may sound self-serving, but we recommend <laughs> hiring a <laughs> competent attorney in your jurisdiction for any of this. <laughs> I also um, recommend that, <laughs> even though it costs more money. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then you can see uh, what what what's actually been registered. What is merely a pending application? What areas have they uh, are they looking to uh, to use it in, or are they are already using it? So yeah, this is this is publicly available, and that's uh, pretty useful. Um, uh, we may I mention that? Yeah. We uh, what is it? we uh, greater than had a, a, an instance recently where. A, uh, a, a video game company uh, had used uh, the word multiverse in their in their name, and they had tried to register a trademark for it. They had not hired an attorney. They had not apparently done a, a search for uh, the word multiverse. And the trademark office said, "No, you make video games. Sentinels the multiverse already exists for video games and board games, and that's the likelihood of confusion." And uh, then they hired an attorney. And uh, contacted us to ask, um, "Hey, can can you let us use that name anyway?" And uh, said, mm, "No, probably not." Because <laughs> like for me, it's super valuable that when you go to the app store and you type in multiverse, then just our stuff shows up. Like that's really great, right? And it helps like distinguish what it is, right? So yeah. yeah. So that's that's a uh, sort of very concrete example of where had they hired an attorney, they might not have run into that problem, and they might not have tried to build their brand off of, uh, on a name that they're gonna have a lot of trouble using. Mm -hmm. And it's especially important to remember not just to like, don't just search for your specific phrase, like ABC multiverse, oh look, nothing came up, I'm fine. But because it's the likelihood of confusion, it's not an exact match. Especially weird words that are like, oh, that's like important because it means something about our brand, like that's important to us. And that's gonna be important to any company that like registered a trademark about it. They're like, we care about these like unique weird words we have or something, right? So, and, and there's like tons of stuff all over Gen Con where you have like, this is a weird company name or a weird thing, like, yeah. yeah. So do you register then after, kick, like say you publish a Pixar mm -hmm. or whatever, you manufactured it, the whole thing? Yeah. That's when you, that's when you register? Yeah. Well, so, it's, it depends. Yeah. So a uh, common practice is to file, as soon as you've decided on the mark, uh, is that you file a, an intent to use application. You tell them, mm -hmm. we're not using this yet, but we plan to. And then you keep renewing that every six months or so until you finally have a, a retail availability. And then you convert it to, you, you send it as a statement of use, and then it gets converted to a regular application, it gets re reviewed and processed and all that. You can wait, uh, you'll save a few hundred bucks in, in fees by doing that, but you will have lost the opportunity to uh, put your place in line. So if you say, I'm fixing to use it before someone else does, then it helps. Yeah. yeah. To, to the world becoming more interconnected, uh, old school, October day, before internet, how does that carry over internationally? 
So trademarks are national. Uh, if you want to, you have a trademark, a protected trademark in Europe, Japan, uh, Australia, Canada, etc. Then you need to register those places yeah, separately. Both places. Yeah, um, most forms of intellectual property are uh, national. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't span uh, borders like that. The EU is that. I'm so we are not specialists in the international aspects of this. Um, so I, I don't want to speak too in too much detail about that. I know more about how the patent. Uh, Patents works in a national trademark system, um, but but uh, but certainly a U.S. mark is not going to help you elsewhere uh, in general. Um, so what does a trademark give you? It gives you the right to exclude others from using a mark, not necessarily an identical one, that is likely to cause confusion, mistake, or deception in the relevant markets. Um, and um, some marks are considered famous, like Donald's, Coca-Cola, uh, which gives the owner the right to exclude others from using the mark in any market or field. It's technically called trademark dilution rather than trademark infringement. Very, very few marks are considered famous. How many of you are, uh, are familiar with coach, handbags, uh, purses, and the like? Yeah, not famous, turns out. Not enough. Um, uh, it's, really? Yeah, it is, it's, uh, it is much more likely that you'll have to worry about avoiding a dilution claim than bringing one. Um, because your, your, your board game would have been more famous than Coach Handbags. Yeah, but like, like the, 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 the board games that are, that are famous, like maybe Monopoly, seriously, and Scrabble, a, a very, very few might raise to that level. It's got to be like in the national consciousness kind of thing. What about D&D? Maybe. I mean, you really, you'd be surprised. A lot of people were shocked by Coach, uh, that, that that was not considered enough. Um, that, that's a pretty well-known national brand. Um, uh, but good news, you probably already know all the famous trademarks. You know, don't call your, your game Coca Cola and Dragons. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're probably fine. Uh, like, you, 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 you will probably be pretty obvious that, wait a minute, that's, I've heard of that one before. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, uh, one big caveat about trademarks that's very different than most other forms of intellectual property. If you make a game, uh, or you make some art for a game, or, or whatever, you can just buy, sell, license, or sell or license that to somebody else. And you can just say, here, you own it now, in exchange for some money, or whatever. You can't necessarily do that with a trademark. If you come up with a really good board game name, and you register it, and then somebody's like, man, that, that name's real good. What if, we, what if you sold us that name? Like, we don't want to make your game. Your game is bad. You have a great name. Can we just have the name? Um, you can't just sell them the, the name and walk away. Um, the the uh, again because that quality control uh, excuse me that consumer protection aspect. What if Nestle decided to just sell their trademark to Aquafina and suddenly Aquafina is putting their terrible water in bottles with Nestle on it and I go to buy it. Oh, it's awful! <laughs> I've been tricked. Um, so uh, it's, it's, so it's, since it's important for consumers to know that that mark means they're getting the thing they think they're getting, um, uh, you can't just give or license the, the mark to just anybody to do whatever they want with. You either have to sell the, like, the whole the business as a going concern so that the product comes with the name, or if you're licensing it, giving them permission to use it, you have to exercise some degree of quality control that, hey, this is going to be the same kind of stuff. Uh, uh, that's, so um, the bottom line is talk to an attorney before licensing themed versions of your game to somebody else in particular. That's, that's the common case, I think, for, for board games is that if you come up with a game like like Flux uh, or uh, Love Letter or something like that that lends itself to variations, the, uh, uh, make sure that you're not just giving them the other company free reign to do whatever they want with it um, because that could jeopardize your, your trademark. Um, uh, you could actually lose the trademark over it. You can license it a lot. It's just like we we have another company that makes a video game, but like yeah, we but have all bunch of stuff for next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 they have a, you know a, a, a window and a hand in the development process, and they can make sure that yeah, this gets our stamp of approval. We we agree that this is a good enough product to have our name on it. Um, um, you may have also how many of you have ever heard uh, when when someone's been sued for trademark infringement. Some said, well, if you own a trademark, you have to enforce it or you might lose it. And so it's, it seems really bad that they're, they're suing this poor little company, but they just had to. Have y'all ever heard that? One, one or two people? Um, that is sort of true. 
Um, just like you have to sort of maintain that quality control aspect if you let other people use a mark, there is a possibility that you could have a mark um, uh, declared uh, abandoned because you weren't enforcing other people's unlicensed uses of it. However, that's not as big a danger as many people have made it out to be. It's pretty uncommon for, uh, for a mark to get um, uh, uh, canceled on that basis. That said, still talk to an attorney if you're uh, uh, if you think your trademark might be infringed and you don't want to bring a lawsuit. The attorney's not necessarily going to say you must sue. I'm sorry, it's it's sue or lose the mark. Um, that's that may not be the outcome. Yeah, isn't um, the the line on that sort of like you knew it was you know being infringed on and you didn't act upon it? So it's more it's more complicated than that. Okay. Um, uh, so there's there's a couple of issues with that one. There's one issue is the the abandonment, the sort of and and that's more about it's really more about like a pattern of really just not caring about anybody using the mark. Like really a bunch of people flagrantly uh, selling stuff with, with with your with your name on it and not caring uh, or with the same same name. Um, and there's also the issue of waiver that if you if you know somebody's using your mark and you don't sue them and a long time goes by and then you suddenly decide that you care several years later and then you sue them, uh, they may be able to argue like, well, you've known for years and haven't done anything. It would be unfair to let you sue now. Um, and there's a lot of special rules about that. Um, we don't want to go into the, that in detail, but um, the bottom line is if you think somebody's using your mark, don't be afraid to talk to an attorney about it. It may not, you know, it may, the answer might not just be, you have no choice but to engage in multi-year Hundred thousand dollar litigation, like it may not be that bad. <laughs> right. It's just a letter to a intent, and you guys can't be doing that. Yeah. So well, so it depends on whether or not they actually uh, stop. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they could take your ce cease and desist and throw it in the trash. Right. Uh, so, um, but but yeah, there are certainly options for suing uh, or or even not. Um, so that's uh, the overview of trademarks. Any quick questions about those? Yeah. So. Like say you start your, your board game design company and it has like your original board game design company name and you have original board game design company dot com and you have on there okay original board game design company TM like and you're intending to publish a game you have no idea what it's gonna take two or three years after the playtesting and everything um I don't, sure I can I can reserve my spot but. It can be kind of pricey every six months to try to do that, and perhaps. And there's a limit on the number of times you can. Right, do and that. so perhaps you don't have the working capital, or that's right. It might the two years might be up before. So my question is, how protected are you if you have? It's pending. It's, well, well, so patent pending is a that's that's the concept of a, a, a pending thing. No, that's a patent I'm just saying, if you have on your website, yeah. like, my company name, TM. Yeah, so that's where you get into common law trademarks, and um, and in fact, uh, the fact that someone's using uh, a mark, um, even though it's not registered, a federally registered trademark, can still prevent somebody else from registering that mark later. Um, the federal trademark register is not the only place that the trademark office looks when they are deciding whether or not it's okay to uh, register a mark. They may say, well. This other company has been around for years. They, they're calling their product the same thing, or the company's called the same thing, or likely no confusion. Um, and so you you can't register a mark on that, even though they don't have a register mark either. The fact that they were this uh, junior user um, is can be sufficient. Uh, now then you can end up with like complicated rules where they've been using it forever, but only in this one little part of the country and in a sort of narrow way, and then you can create. Uh, agreements with them that say we'll never sell in that in like Seattle, but we'll sell everywhere else in the country, and you can keep your little Seattle market. So trademarks can be flexible in that way, um, but the point is to again to avoid that confusion so that people know that hey, if I'm in Seattle and I go to the, this board game store that has the same name, I know that's same trusty Seattle board game shop, and in the rest of the country it's this other thing. Um, so trademarks can be can have some flexibility there, but that. That takes work to accomplish, and sometimes it may be easier to just come up with a new name, especially in the early stages. I was going to say, registered is best, and if it's not registered, the more you use it in commerce and the more places it is, yeah, the better off you know, you are. As you're trying to 
Yeah, it's a business brand decision. That you're, you have your Instagram and your Twitter and your Facebook page and your yeah. Google Plus. I mean, your name's everywhere, but it's not yeah, registered. You don't have to well, and something to bear in mind is that you can be using the name everywhere, but if you're not you're not selling any products that yeah. actually have the net name on it, then you're it's not really using it in commerce from the trademark office's point of view. Um, so that 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 is something else to bear in mind. Products I mean, in that class, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, at least um, so. it can't be like a company's merchandise T-shirt either. Uh, yeah, so there's a whole thing about ancillary um, uh, marketing stuff, um, like you know, pins and t-shirts and whatever. Um, so that's that's yeah, the, another com complication and wrinkle. Would that help you protect it if I wanted to make just mugs for the company and be like, well, that's my logo and my name on that mug. It's not in the class of the board game, but I'm still selling them. I still have them. So it wouldn't help you register a board game mark. Uh, no, but it might but help, it would you help you protect, protect you. you. Uh, well, uh, maybe. It's nope. complicated. Maybe. Uh, I mean, it might. One thing it would do is it would give public notice of that mark so that if somebody was very conscientious, they would look it up and then they, if they had a similar mark, your name popped up on a trademark search when they were doing due diligence. And then they looked into your company and then that might dissuade them from, you know, going ahead and using that name. That, but they could also make the business decision like, ah, eh, that they're not filed in the board game. We're going to go ahead and try for it anyway. So uh, let's move on to patents. So this is my my what? thing. Oh, okay. uh, TM is is the common law, and R means it's actually registered, right? The, again, that's what this how it's meant to be used. Uh, it, sometimes people use R even when uh, it hasn't been registered yet because uh, they don't understand that that's what it's for. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's what it's how it's supposed to be. So again, you could just put TM when you start selling while you're waiting to be registered to kind of indicate. Yeah, yeah. It could be like trademark pending. Uh, sort of. And this is. Um, patent pending, patent pending means you've actually filed a patent application and right. you have good faith reasons to think that it will be uh, uh, granted. Um, so, it, whereas putting TM on, on something, you could do that for 100 years and it won't ever turn into a federal a registered trademark, you have to actually send in that application. Um, so it's a, a little different, but it will it would again help signal to other people. I'm using this as a, like I'm using this as a trademark. Think twice before you decide that you want to choose that for yourself. If for no other reason than in the public consciousness, people already associate this name with my brand. Um, do you really want to sort of start ten feet behind uh, in the market, uh, trying to convince people that no, it means our product? Um, so patents are super important in the board game context. Uh, we're going to talk about one recent big exception uh, that I think is just kind of an interesting story. Um, but real quick recap of pat patents. Patents are for, there's two kinds of patents, utility patents and design patents. When you think about patents, you probably think about utility patents. Um, utility patents cover new, useful, that's the utility part, non-obvious inventions for a limited lifetime, 20 years from filing date. Um, and they grant you the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell, or importing uh, anything that uses the, the invention. Um, taking Applying for a patent takes like one to three years, costs several thousand dollars to several tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the complexity of the invention and how much arguing you have to do with the patent office and how expensive an attorney you hire. Uh, like other kinds of uh, intellectual property, patents are national, so if you want it in another country, that costs more money, including possibly translators, and the costs get out of hand really, really fast, um, which is why it's not very common in the board game context. Um, importantly, a patent only grants that right to exclude others. That's one of the main reasons I'm going to mention this. You don't need a patent in order to do something. You, know, you, can, you can, right now, you can do anything. You can, you can make any invention you want, even a patented one. You might get sued for it, but you could do that. And you can certainly do, so a patent doesn't give you the right to do the invention, it gives you the right to exclude other people from doing the invention. So, so don't think that if you come up with some neat little uh, board game mechanical device or something like that, that, oh no, we have to patent it before we can sell it. Like, no, you, you, just, you could just sell it, it's fine. Um, and as with all these other aspects of intellectual property, a patent or copyright or trademark is not a license to print money. You still have to have a good business model. Uh, you still have to have a good game, good product, and a, and a good business model for, for commercializing it. Um, you can't just say, oh, well, we got a patent. Great. And the money is going to start flowing in any day now. No. Um, uh, patents are usually a good way to spend a lot of money, not necessarily a good way to make it. Um, because of the expense uh, and, and, and exercising that exclusivity, 
actually excluding other people from using a, a patent costs a lot of money. We'll see it uh, in a moment. So because of the expense, risk, and time involved, it's not a, patents aren't a common part of most board game companies' uh, IP portfolios. But there have been a couple of notable examples. One is the Magic the Gathering TAC patent. So in, how many of you played Magic or at least familiar with, with the rules? That notion of turning a card a little bit in order to indicate that it has been used in some way was patented uh, by, uh, by Wizards um, and Wizards of the Coast. And indeed, you may have noticed that other, a lot of other games, like uh, Arkham Horror, I think, uses Exhausted. Yeah. Yeah, that, that you, don't, you don't tap a card in, in Arkham Horror, you do something else with it to indicate that it has been exhausted, it's been used up for that, that turn. Um, the, that patent has expired. So uh, uh, as, far as, as far as I'm aware, you, you're free to use a tapping mechanic in your, in your game. Um, I, I don't know if they have a trademark on the word tap, so bear that in mind, but, um, but at least the patent You could probably turn a card sideways in any case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but, that, but that was an example that, that had a real effect on the industry. People actually had to design around it in their games and take that into account. Um, whether that patent would hold up to scrutiny today, if that had never been invented and so Richard Garfield came up with it today and tried to patent it, I think there's a very good chance the patent office would say, um, no, you can't patent that. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, an abstract idea or it's uh, too close to just like a, a mental process. Um, so, but in any event. So even parts and pieces would be applicable there, like uh, Trivial Pursuit, the pie slices, or the spinner in life? If you invented the spinner, like, like for real, you were the very first person to ever invent the idea of generating finding a random number by or yeah. a random thing by spinning a little indicator. Yeah, you could possibly patent that. Um, uh, so, so maybe if again, if you came with this interesting functional aspect of your game. Um, how many of you all have heard of or played the game Ket? K H E T. One guy. Great. Um, so it's it's like it's uh, I've not played it myself, but my understanding is this it's it's a it's a board game vaguely like chess, and you got pieces on a, a in a space, and there's lasers, and the pieces have little reflective things on them, and some, some, some sensors, and so it's uh, it's a little more complicated than most games from a technological point of view. Um, but uh, some people uh, invented that, and they patented it. The patent was granted in 2007, and um, uh, another company came up with a game that they called Laser Battle that was pretty much a strip, straight ripoff um, of, of Cat. And so Cat filed for a patent infringement suit. He said, your game infringes our patent on, that was basically the, uh, on a board game that uses these lasers and sensors and reflection and stuff to, to, to accomplish something in the game. And 10 years <coughs> later, after 10 years of litigation uh, that included a brief trip to the Supreme Court the patent was found valid and infringed. The defendants were to pay $1.4 million in damages, plus another $2.8 million in extra damages because the infringement was willful, plus $2 million in attorney's fees, again, because the infringement was willful, uh, which means they, they totally knew about the patent and they did it anyway. Um, and the case was still not fully resolved as of April. Um, it was being argued whether the defendants had to pay another $800,000 in attorney's fees, the attorney's fees for the appeal. Um, and so that sounds pretty impressive, right? They're getting $4.2 million in damages plus their attorney's fees paid for. Um, that sounds pretty great, right? I mean, how many of your companies would like, like, like to get $4.2 million? Um, except that they had to spend $2.8 million in attorney's fees over 10 years to get it. And that's not unusual in patent litigation. If there's one to, two, one to $10 million at stake in litigation, which there was in this case, then spending a couple million dollars in attorney's fees is about right. Um, so how many of your, you or your companies could afford to spend $280,000 a year for a decade chasing a court case? Anybody here? <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could do that. Uh, I would just retire. Uh, I, would just, like, I would just keep my $2.8 million. Um, and there was no guarantee they were going to win. Most of the time, the patent owner loses in, in a patent infringement case. So they could have spent 2.8 million, they could have spent 10 years and ended up with nothing but a $2.8 million bill from their law firm. How many of you, now, now there's the real question. How many of your companies could, could afford to just throw $2.8 million away 
and have nothing for it except a company ripping you off. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, it's a very interesting case because it, it, it turned out so well for that company and, and kudos to them. Uh, but, but that's why most board game companies decide not to even worry yeah, about Yeah, not to even bother. Not to spend ten thousand, tens of thousands of dollars to get a patent and then just for the chance to spend $2.8 million over yeah. 10 years <laughs> to maybe not get something. Like, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, sometimes. So, um, is a general rule uh, not um, uh, in trademark? Uh, I believe you, you generally have to, to prove that the case was exceptional in, in a uh, again like a willful uh, infringement kind of kind of thing in the trademark case. In the copyright case, it's a little easier uh, to get your attorney's fees, um, but but still um, still by no means guaranteed. And then the other issue is that. Great. The others like two point eight million dollars in attorney's fees. Yeah, but what if the other side didn't have the money? Um, so when you start tossing all the, or the four point two million in damages, for that matter, um, it's all well and good to have a court say they you know they owe you millions of dollars, and then they say, well, we declare bankruptcy. You got us, and uh, you're gonna get like whatever's in the till, and you know we'll sell like the warehouse and stuff, and you know, maybe you get a fraction of that. Um, if in this case they were lucky because who they were really suing was not the company that made Laser Battle. Who they were really suing was Barnes and Noble and Target and, and so forth, uh, well, all, the, all the big companies that were selling it. Uh, because uh, if you remember what I said earlier about what a patent gets you, it gives you the right to exclude others from, among other things, selling the invention. So they got all the distributors. Uh, yeah, at least, in, well, not necessarily the distributors, the end the in, uh, retailers. The in retailers. Um, now, the, in all likelihood, a, a retailer like Amazon or Target or whatever is not going to be so stupid as to not have an indemnification agreement where they would say, if we get sued for patent infringement because of selling your product, you have to pay us. So it, it ultimately, but the thing is, is that that's, that's Amazon's problem. That's Target's problem to get that money from the uh, maker of the game. They are still going to have to pay up to the patent owner, um, but they may be able to recover it from the, uh, from the, uh, the game company um, so uh, so likely in all likelihood that company will probably actually get its money um, but uh, but that's an unusual case if your game was just being sold or if the if the um, infringing game was just being sold by hobbyist game stores and not by a big retailer how many mom-and-pop game stores do you think have got 4.2 million dollars laying around to pay you not very many the other thing about attorneys fees to remember is that one in most of these cases for IP um, you're advancing your attorney's fees as they're incurred. Um, so you get the award at the end, maybe, um, but you've already paid that money out. The other thing to remember, too, is that most, the vast, vast, vast majority of these cases are going to settle. And most settlement agreements provide that each side pays their own attorney's fees. Yeah. Uh, now, you can take that into account with your settlement amount, but. Yeah, when we say the majority, we mean like 95% plus. It's really common that a okay, case okay, settles before no, no decision on the, on the merits of my fire. So in that case where it was these big box retailers selling the game, how is damages just like spread across them and the creator of this game? Or what? Uh, there's a whole business of calculating patent damages that's uh, complicated. There, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, uh, lost profits, reasonable royalty, and what counts, what, how you calculate a reasonable royalty is a whole big big thing. But it's, it's whatever metric they decide on, it's, it's going to be proportional to the number of units sold and how much they were selling them for. So if, if one retailer was typically selling them for MSRP, whereas another was a deep discounter, then you might get more money from the MSRP seller because if you were using a you know five percent reasonable royalty and selling for fifty dollars a game versus uh, twenty five dollars a game, it, it's it's, it's, it's all very factor. But yeah, some amount factor. of that would go back to the original knockoff creator as damaged, right? You don't well. You'd also have a cause of action against him, so yeah, you, you can only ca collect the total amount of damages, but how and who you collect them from and how they can then try and apportion and get their money back from the other co-defendants is a long, involved process. Yeah. And there's insurers and stuff yes. too, right? Yeah, so uh, it is possible to buy intellectual property insurance, basically, to say that uh, if we, it turns out we screwed up and burned somebody's patent, like our insurer can help deal with that. Um, 
That is not necessarily something you get automatically with whatever general business insurance you have. I think it's almost certainly not the case. Um, so it's a thing you'll have to buy separately, but that may be something that's worth looking into in your in your business, especially if you're gonna try to skirt that fair use line, then you might really look into it. <laughs> Um, but sorry if I'm wrong, like I suspect that in this case, where they like the court found that they like blatantly on purpose violated the patent, yeah. that like surely the insurance would be like, yeah. well, if you do it on purpose, like most, yeah, most not IP cover policies you. have a you can't knowing. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and in fact, in fact, I think that it's not possible for them to have that moral, yeah. moral hazard yeah. issue. But so. that doesn't mean the target's policy. Right. Cover, of course. But. Yeah. 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 So that that's a little different. Um, so that's uh, and then there's design patents. Design patents uh, cover the non-functional, purely ornamental design of an object or part of an object. So you probably all heard about the, the Apple, Samsung lawsuits about rounded rectangles. So that had nothing to do with what the, what the phone does as a phone, or the software on it, or hardware features, or anything like that. It just had to do with the shape of the, the box that came in, which could have been any shape. Um, so uh, in some ways, utility patents and uh, design patents are totally different. And they, they cover completely different kinds of, of subject matter. But they're very similar in the sense that it still has to be new and non-obvious, and the standards for infringement are similar, and that kind of thing. Um, so an example could be a board game layout or the design of a game card. Um, uh, but um, the problem with trying to come up with uh, something, and there are a lot of design patents in the, in the game industry, much more than utility patents. Um, the problem with trying to get a design patent in the board game industry is that, again, it has to be new and non-obvious, and there's a lot of prior art in the board game industry. It's pretty difficult to come up with a uh, design for a playing card uh, that is you know, a truly new design and not just a slightly obvious tweak of an old one. Um, you know, how, how, well, if you think about the design of a Magic the Gathering card, how many uh, games, both trading card games and, and, and non-trading card games, have cards that are basically a Magic the Gathering layout. You've got how much it costs to get it in some in one corner. You've got its basic attributes in another. You've got a picture, some flavor text. That's a really, really common layout. Um, and maybe it's a different. Maybe the parts are in different corners, but the the basic aspect is still there. So trying to uh, uh, get a patent on on a on a, those things can be a little difficult. And um, again, just like with. Uh, utility patents, you have all the issues of the expense to get it uh, and the expense to enforce it. Uh, two real quick things about trade secrets and trade dress. Uh, trade secrets, pretty straightforward. They are secrets, the things that are not publicly known. Um, and the neat thing about trade secrets is that they can last in indefinitely as long as you keep it a secret. How do you keep it a secret? Non disclosure agreements. Clearly identifying trade secret information, like on, on documents and stuff, confidential, proprietary, trade secret, do not distribute, that kind of thing. And taking actual practical steps to maintain secrecy. An honor system is not enough. So passwords on documents, uh, only only sharing uh, shared folders with certain people who need to know, locks on file cabinet, that kind of stuff. Um, what's, what's, the, what's the point of doing this? It's so that if somebody violates that non-disclosure agreement, if somebody violates their employee agreement and takes something out of the filing cabinet they weren't supposed to, and takes it to the competitor or whatever, so you can sue them uh, for uh, a trade secret violation. Uh, in this industry, it's not real common because, again, it only applies to secrets, and we're mostly in the business of selling products to the public, and so it's not a secret anymore. Um, but unpublished game ideas, uh, locked Kickstarter rewards that haven't been revealed yet, and you want to have it be a big surprise when it comes out, product roadmaps, customer lists, uh, data on costs and margins that can be important for proprietary information uh, that you may want to keep secret. And you don't want to necessarily want an employee to be able to uh, you know, quit, go to your competitor and say, I know exactly how much their products cost, how much they pay their manufacturers to, to make it, what their margins are uh, for, for all the different distributors and everything. Like That's, that's important. Um, and it may be uh, useful to, to keep uh, some protection for. Uh, then finally, trade dress. Um, which again uh, is not quite as important, but I think it, it can still matter, especially for some kinds of games. Trade dress is a little bit like a trade mark, uh, except it's rather than just a single word or phrase or picture or something that's really easy to identify, it's the sort of holistic total image of a product, including its size, shape, color, color combinations, texture, graphics, even particular sales techniques, uh, that, that whole general gestalt 
uh, uh, so if you think about a chain restaurant, just imagine your head any chain restaurant. Um, the trade dress of that restaurant may include the shape and general appearance of the exterior of the restaurant, the identifying sign, uh, the kitchen floor plan, the decor, the menu, any special equipment used to serve food, the servers, uniforms, everything reflecting the total image. So you probably had no, it's probably pretty easy to say, oh yeah, I'm thinking of McDonald's, Taco Bell, Applebee's, whatever. You can imagine what the, ser what the uh, servers wear as their uniform. You can think about what the logo outside, the sign outside looks like, what most of the restaurants look like physically. It, it comes to mind. Um, uh, the, the catch with trade dress is that it's actually, you can register trade dress, but most trade dress cases involve unregistered trade dress because most companies don't necessarily bother uh, registering all that general stuff. Um, uh, an important requirement for trade dress is that it must be inherently distinctive. You can't just say, hey, this is, this is what our board game box looks like. It, it has to be an inher inherently distinctive board game box. Uh, or if it isn't inherently distinctive, it isn't like maybe you sell your box and it comes in like a dodecahedron or something like that. It's really weird. People, it's not just the usual cube. Um, or maybe it's not so distinctive on its own, but over time it's acquired secondary meaning. Um, so secondary meaning is the association in potential consumers' minds between the trade dress and the source of the goods or services, rather than the goods or services themselves. In case you didn't follow that, which I totally understand, imagine that if you see a coffee cup that's got some green writing and some kind of green little, little green picture on it, it's, it's think, looking at that and thinking, ah, Starbucks cup, and not just thinking it's a cup of coffee. Um, so this, this, the, that trade dress, that the way that cup is uh, shaped and the, the particular shade of green, and I'm sure it's a very particular shade of green, um, is something that Starbucks may consider an important trade dress for their, uh, their company. Um, it can't be functional, and it must be more than just like a vague or abstract image or marketing theme. It's got to be pretty particular. Um, and uh, again, you can... You can uh, Sue for trade dress infringement in, in federal court or also in state court, but it's much less common. Um, notable case, uh, how many of you are, all are familiar with Battletech or MechWarrior or any of that kind of stuff? FASA. Um, so uh, there was a case way back in the 90s um, uh, uh, where the court held that some but not all the robot designs in Battletech were distinctive enough from the other robots of the mecha genre to be protectable. So not just any of them. Some of them were like, yeah, nah, that's pretty generic, or like that's similar to other robot designs that other people have had um, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, but some of them, some very specific ones, were, were considered, oh, that's like really uniquely Battletech uh, specific. And so they could keep other people from, from copying that design. Not at the level of a copyright protection, but at, the, at, at a more general level of like just the general look and feel of, of, that, uh, of that robot. Uh, any trade dress questions? It's not so common. I think I think that um, uh, copyright and uh, and trademark uh, are again to, to recap going to tend to be the most important. But I think it's useful to lay out the whole the whole universe. What was the one before trade dress? Uh, trade secrets. Trade secrets. Do either of those need to be registered? No. In fact, there's no there's no way to there's, yeah there's no real way to do there's no real way to register trade secrets. That's kind of the thing. They're secret. Um, uh, Although sometimes when you like register for a patent, or excuse me, apply for a patent, uh, or a copyright, if you register a copyright, that might include some trade secret information, and there's ways to tell the patent office or the copyright office, like, hey, don't, don't publish that part. That part's secret, but the rest of it is, 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 uh, is important. Um, but, it, but a trade secret alone, no, you don't, you don't like register that anywhere. That's just sort of, you get it by dint of keeping it secret. Um, trade dress can be registered with the trademark office. Um, uh, and in fact, there's like colors and even like sounds, uh, like the sound of a Harley engine are things that people uh, consider protectable trade dress. Um, uh, but in most cases, people actually don't register trade dress. You, you don't have to have it registered to sue. Uh, it's, it's very, very different than uh, trademarks. If you want to sue in federal court for trademark infringement, you have to have registered your trademark. If you want to sue for copyright infringement, you have to have registered your copyright. If you want to sue for patent infringement, obviously you have to have a patent. You have to uh, apply for and receive the patent. Uh, but for trade dress, it's the other way, it's the other way around. We, you don't have to register uh, first. You can just sue and say, we believe our trade dress is uh, either inherently distinctive or it's acquired secondary meaning and sue them. 
you don't hear about trade dress as much in the United States. It works very, very differently depending on what country you're talking about, and it's not one of the strongest IP protections in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, this one trade secrets, would you put that in like a partner operating agreement or something like that? This is the part specifically for us. Uh, we will touch on that in just a second. Yeah. Uh, one more question. So the trade dress, I had asked a question about like just a car and the text on one side, mm -hmm. text on the other. It's Yes. Red and white, or red and white on one side, it's white and black on the other side. So that's where the inherently distinctive or secondary meaning comes in. If you come up with a, a design that, man, that is that is really uniquely your thing, like maybe it's not a rectangle, maybe it's some really unusual shape that people... No, just a regular, I'm just well, I, I, but, just a color. Sure, yeah, well, in that, in that case, you probably go to, has it acquired secondary meaning? Have Has it become a popular enough game, or, or at least a well-known enough game, that the, the market in general, the potential consumers will, will look at that and say, yeah, like, I, I, know, I recognize that kind of car. Like, um, they're not a client. I'm not necessarily saying, I'm not saying this is necessarily the case, but if you think about the Cards Against Humanity cards, they've, I think, they would at least have a plausible argument for, for trade dress protection in, in their card design. That even though it's very, very simple, the fact that it is so simple and stark uh, and has that like the black cards, the white cards, and so forth, Eh, they might have an argument there. Now, they're actually pretty cool with people ripping them off, so uh, I, I don't know if they bother. <laughs> but use their font. They actually have a warning on their website. Ah, okay. Uh, but, but... It's uh, like a font and certain work style, basically the stylization of their words. Ah, okay. Oh, and how the they font is very specific. And it's, they have a list on their website about it. About not using that, or, or basically how they have done theirs so you don't copy it. Yeah, so there you go. So they do care about their fans. That, that that very specific arrangement, they they are they are carving that out for themselves, and that would be an example of trade dress, not copyright, not uh, trademark. Would be, that would be a trade dress thing. All right. Yeah. Now we're going to go on to sort of the corporate law side of IP protection. A lot of times, especially when you're in a startup, you'll go ahead and you'll spend money to register a trademark or everything, but you you don't necessarily have all of your ducks in a row. So there are, there are sort of two important reasons why you're going to consider you know corporate organization and keeping that in mind when you're talking about all of these IP productions. One is from an infringement basis. You want to do your due diligence so that you don't have to worry about being sued for infringement. So when you're thinking of a name before you start branding, before you do everything, you know, we talked about potentially hiring an attorney. Other, there are other third party companies that aren't attorneys, but at a very minimum, search the PTO, do a Google search, see if there's anything at all similar that you're worried about. Because when you get that cease and desist letter and you're a startup, that's, uh, that, you know, that's very nerve wracking. Even if the company decides to play nice and they, they even say, you know, we're not gonna sue you for damages, rebranding can be expensive, especially depending on how far down the line you are. If you already sent that giant order to China. <laughs> that's a problem. Uh, the other reason that is important to remember all of your corporate considerations is so that you are real, you're able to realize the value of your IP. It's all well and good to pay the PTO a whole bunch of money to get your trademarks, but if they're not correctly, if the entity doesn't own them and you end up filing suit and don't have rights, like it'll come out in discovery and your company's not gonna be, have what you think it has. Or if you go to sell your company later, the buyer is going to want to make sure that it's actually the entity whose assets is buying owns all of the assets. So it, it's, it's very important. From a basic standpoint for corporate registration, the first step is you register with the state. Um, there's various types of corporate um, entities, limited liability companies are very common, corporations as well, less common, limited partnerships, even less common than that. And an attorney can advise you on which of those are important. But one thing to keep in mind when you register with the Secretary of State, as long as there's not another business in that state, uh, they're probably going to issue that name. That doesn't mean that it's not infringing, though. So don't take the, hey, I registered my business as uh, a, a way that means, oh, I'm OK in the future. It just means somebody doesn't have literally that exact name. Mm -hmm. In that particular state. Uh, the other important thing to remember when you're doing all this is calendar your deadlines for filing, especially when you're talking about uh, trademarks and registering an intent to use. Make sure you calendar those every six months and that everyone knows about them. Um, just 
simple things like that are easy ways to sort of lose your protection. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when you're forming your company, do you already have anything that you've already created? you're gonna to want to assign that into the company. Similarly, if you've registered a trademark already in your individual name, you have to go ahead and file an assignment with the PTO to get it into the name of the entity, ultimately, so that you're protected from a liability standpoint, you want all of the assets to be held by the entity name. Uh, the next, and the, the thing is, if the IP is not owned by the corporate entity, you need to make sure one, we just talked about assignment, or two, make sure you have a license for it. In general, if it's something that you've created and it's your company, you want the company to own it. Um, but if you're producing someone else's game or something, you're gonna have a license for that and they'll probably still own it. Um, contracts, when you're making contracts, so let's say you have a board game and you're not an artist, you want to hire an artist. Uh, Make sure you contract in the name of the company. If you have more than one company, make sure that the company name you're using goes for the contract, goes with the same company that's going to be producing that game. Similarly, if you're licensing content from someone else, make sure that you license in the name of the entity that's producing the game and all of your artist contracts are in the name of that same company. It's, it's just, it's an organization thing, but it's very easy to mess up and it's harder to go back and fix than it is to do it right in the first place. And a lot of these things, like calendaring deadlines, making sure that the right names are the right forms and all that kind of stuff, that's the sort of thing, that's one of the reasons that you hire an attorney, is to understand all that and keep track of all that. Mm -hmm. um, the other important thing when you're doing agreements is with IP protection is there's different rules for ownership of IP at the time of creation. And so you have to be careful in how you're structuring your agreements both with employees and with independent contractors. Independent contractors are free, like the freelancers you hire who um, don't work as an employee for you, they use your own materials and they sort of, they have a deliverable like artwork for a particular board game. So trade secrets we touched on, this needs a non-disclosure and confidentiality agreement, um, an obligation to keep secret. That can be in your employment agreement. It can be in your, for as to the owners of the company, if you have multiple owners, it can also be in your uh, operating agreement if it's an LLC, in your bylaws or shareholders agreement if it's a corporation. You're also going to want to include it in all of your independent contractor agreements. For the most part, the easiest way to avoid trade secret disclosure is to keep the people who you're disclosing it to at, at the bare minimum. But that being said, if you have an artist who's doing a, a board game, cover design for you, they're probably going to have, you know, the name of the game and they're going to know sort of in general the schedule because they'll know their deliverable schedule so they know about when you're releasing it, that sort of thing. So even things that you might not think of, if you might want to keep it confidential, it's easiest just to have, have the, the agreement in there. Um, copyright and patents also create ownership issues. The, by default, they uh, are owned by the creator, which can be a problem for an entity because in general, the entity itself is not capable of creating anything individuals create. This, so, is, this is different in the US than in virtually the, anywhere else in the world. The US, because of the constitutional issue with regard to how copyrights and patents are established in the constitution, um, uh, has copyright and patent be, exist with the creator first. In other countries, it's a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. So copyright, and patent both work a little bit differently. Copyright, if you're an employee and you're acting within the scope of your employment, the copyright actually invests with the employer. So the easiest example is you're a board game company, you have a W-2 employee who you have hired as a game designer who is designing a game at work during business hours for the company. Using a company computer, the whole bit. Yes, that copyright with the entity. Um, the patent works a little bit different. A patent, even if it's an employee working within the scope of employment for the employer, it doesn't automatically vest with the entity. They need an explicit obligation to assign, which is why even in states where you have um, work for hire, you're still probably going to want an employment contract because it'll cover both copyright and patent. It'll say, you know, it vests automatically with the employer um, and to the extent it doesn't, and to the extent it's patentable, you're, you agree to assign it in the future. Uh, independent contractors are a little bit trickier because they're not employees, so it, the law sort of says more likely to be owned by the independent contractor. So into the, the there are exceptions. There are some statutory exceptions. Um, you might have heard of work made for hire or work for hire. Um, 
So that has to still be in a written agreement. And it has to be one of the statutory exceptions to fall into a work for hire. So a contribution to a compilation is one. But um, so, so not to clarify, mm -hmm. not all kinds of copyrightable works can be made a work for hire. There's a specific list of the kinds of copyrighted stuff that could be the subject of a work for hire contract. And if it's not one of those, even if you have a work for hire agreement, it'll still just be with the independent contractor. And we'll talk about how to work around that. Yeah. So how, and how, so how you work around that is very similar to the employment agreement and getting paid. So you have your work for hire agreeing it's a work for hire. And then if not, you have an obligation to assign as well. And this is all in your independent contractor agreements because even co copyright, which unlike patents, is actually very important for board games. You know, it's going to vest with the independent contractor unless you have this separate agreement yes. specifying work for hire and an obligation to assign. And you know, if the independent contractor is holding the copyright for a lot of your important art, that that's a, that's a significant issue. So, so <laughs> yeah, they could they could they can hold it for ransom basically. Mm -hmm. That's a real problem. So you'd have that two step process. You have work for hire by default. Great. You own it as soon as they make it, just like if they were an employee. Or uh, and then, if not that, then uh, then the obligation to assign. No nope. obligation to assign. That means that at some point they do actually have to sign another piece of paperwork that assigns it, and you have to make sure you do actually carry that through, or else the company doesn't own it. And when we talk about like deadlines and missing filing stuff, assigning it to the wrong place, using the wrong name, all that stuff, companies large and small get tripped up by that all the time. They try to sue for infringement, and then only to get told, you don't actually own that. You never filled them out the paperwork. Go away. And it's important for your owners, too. So let's say you have three friends who start a company. Um, at some point, they should do, and later they become employees. But when you start, you're not doing W-2 employee wages. Have a bill of sale and assignment, assigning anything they make into the company. Get it into the company's name so that the company that's doing business with that, you don't have to worry about licenses and it's, you know, the liability you're protected by that corporate shield. And one last point about, um, about uh, work for hire. Uh, if you are working with an independent contractor, uh, we, we recommend in general doc, uh, hiring an attorney for all these things, but really, really, really hire an attorney if you, work, if, you have, if you have independent contractors, because the work for hire part in particular can get very easily tripped up on there are very specific requirements for what makes a work for hire agreement. Like it has to be in writing. No amount of verbal contracting, an oral contract, a verbal contract is a thing. There's no such thing as a verbal work for hire agreement. It has to be in writing. And it has to include the magic phrase, work made for hire. If it doesn't have those very words, it doesn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't a work made for hire. It's a statutory exception, so it's very technical. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, just created at the courts or the common law. So you have to follow sort of check all of the statutory boxes. In general, in our agreements, the work made for hire assignment, and we also have a power of attorney if you refuse to sign our assignment, is about a page, a page and a half long. It's yeah. it's involved. For work for hire, if you were to do something like so you're developing your own game, doing your own thing, and got some artwork done and it is work for hire, we're like they can redo print, you have the right for use it for your board game item specifically, and you go and like where you then games is interested, are you able to transfer that copyright to them or do you have to go back to the original partners and get that redone? If it, so the idea with work made for hire and having the assignment provision in there is that that allows the ent assuming you do everything correctly, that means that the entity that's sort of the contracting entity instead of the contractor, that they own the copyright. Okay. And then you could then go ahead and license it or assign it, sell it but, correctly. But to, but you can't sell more than you own. Correct. If we yes. if, if the agreement said we own the copyright, you know, we're from hire, we're made for hire, etc. But you keep the right to like sell some prints or display it in your portfolio or whatever. Great. Yeah. You go and sell this to another company, like, hey, you want to you want to make my game? We're going to save this game. Great. They still retain that right, yeah. generally speaking. It, you could have a provision that says you only retain that right unless we sell it, and then you're out of luck. But but by by in general, you can't sell more than you own. So anybody that still retains a license or some other piece of ownership, they still have that, even if you move the rest of it around. Mm -hmm. That sounds very, very complex and very confusing. Where can I go to understand it better? Because I feel like you could spend the next <laughs> hour going over this whole thing. 
An attorney. <laughs> <laughs> the, short, the short answer is an attorney, and the long answer is uh, don't go to law school. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> good. But an IP attorney is. Uh, or a well, corporate attorney. So uh, one quick uh, point, um, I, as Paul mentioned, I'm a patent attorney. What that means uh, th is that I can represent people before the patent the patent office. If somebody wants to file for a patent, they can't go to just any attorney. They have to go to an attorney who's registered there, which basically means I have a science degree and I took a test um, uh, in addition to being an attorney. Um, but, not, but that is like the one special thing that not just any attorney can do. Literally everything else, including suing for patent infringement, any attorney can do. Um, so that is not to say that all attorneys are equal by any means, um, but you don't necessarily have to go to a specialized IP attorney in order to get uh, IP advice. Now, you go to a, a given attorney, like they'll say, I don't know, I, re I write wills for a living, man. I, I, I can't really help you, but okay. Uh, but, um, but so you might want to talk to an IP attorney, a specialist IP attorney, but it's not strictly necessary. The other thing to keep in mind too when you're hiring attorneys and looking to save on legal fees is you can go to a really large law firm that will have all of the IP specialties, patent attorneys, corporate attorneys, everything in-house, but their billable rates are in general going to be much higher. Um, I myself work for a 15 attorney law firm. We do IP licensing, but we don't file patent applications. Um, but we have relationships with other firms and stuff that we refer out to. Um, to handle the sort of specialist matters. And so smaller law firms in general um, that still have a good reputation uh, in the corporate field are going to be cheaper. And then you can pay that higher rate, but only where you need to pay the higher rate.